the shame of this situation was really unbearable. Um, You know, preachers only work one day a week. Y'all know that? And then they go and get me this nice plush seat. And so I can sit down when I work. Isn't that cool? It was our eighth grade graduation. And we had just finished the ceremony. And Juanette Dowd was in my class, and she was standing over by herself, just crying her eyes out. And that got all of our attention, and two or three of us went over to Juanette and said, Juanette, what, what's going on? Why are you crying? We're, we're going to high school next year. This is a celebration kind of a time, you know. She said, I'm sad because I'm moving. My parents are moving. And I'm not going to be with my friends anymore. And she could have pulled out a big dagger and stuck it right into my heart. Because from first grade through grammar school, her nickname was Skunk. You know how kids can be to other kids. And I was involved in that ridicule and putting down of this girl. And the shame overwhelmed me in that moment. So I did what an eighth grade boy might think of doing. I quickly ran across the highway to Dick Kessler's store service station and jot them down kind of store. And I ran over to the candy section and I saw this box of chocolate covered cherries. You like those? And in my 14 year old brain, I bought that box of chocolates and I took it, ran back over to the school and found one at. And I handed them to her. And I said, I'm sorry. See, I felt shame. And I think about Juanette from time to time, particularly when we have our, our high school reunion. And I've never seen her again. I've never been in her presence again since eighth grade graduation. Shame has a way of hanging on. This series that we're in this month, it's uh, very interesting. Because shame is a very heavy subject for Christmas time. Last week we dealt with overcoming offenses. Today, overcoming shame, and the next week, overcoming labels. Because what happens is that, that, that these different emotions, they tend to linger and be in our lives when we want to get rid of them. And I would ask you this morning, uh, do you remember the last time you felt shame? I always think about Mark Twain's quote where he said, the human being is the only animal that blushes or has a reason to. I wonder if we feel shame for some sinful things that we've done in our lives. And the idea is that, I don't know about you growing up, but it might have been your mom, your dad, or a teacher And they might have said this to you. You should be ashamed of yourself. You ever had anybody tell you that? Boy, you should be ashamed of yourself of what you just did. And truthfully, the incident with Juanette Dowd was probably one of the most shameful things I remember. There's been others, of course. 
But that one just gets me right here. Because shame is a powerful emotion. It's soul crushing. It's it's identity warping for a lot of people. And here's why. Guilt is I did bad. Shame is I am bad. See the difference? I may feel guilty that I did something bad. But when it comes to shame, it's I am a bad person. And so that has a tendency to connect what happened with who we are. In other words, we think that because we feel shame in our lives and this deep emotion in us, that that's who we are. In other words, our identity is connected with what we have said or what we have done. So we say, I, I did bad. And then we think, I am bad. And then here's where we go with this. Since I am bad, God rejects me. God doesn't want to have anything to do with me because I am a bad person. So I'm nothing. After what I did, I'm a worthless individual. And that's what shame can do. Move into our lives and cause us an identity crisis, if you want to put it that way. And it's not that we do bad, but we internalize it and we believe that we are bad. Could be many things. I'm defective. I'm damaged, I'm broken, I'm flawed, I am dirty, I'm ugly, I'm impure, I'm disgusting. Even to God, I'm disgusting. And so we allow our actions to be our identity. And we start to think totally, I am a bad person. And I would call that shame-based thinking. That means that everything that, that I think and everything that, that I strive to do, it starts from shame and moves in a direction. That's the basis. That is the fundamental foundation that I think with. And that is that I am a shameful, horrible person. We think our identity is about the things we did. And we think nobody likes me. And nobody loves me because I am a bad person. That's why we have to be careful with little children. That we help them understand the difference between guilt and shame. And that we give them an opportunity to move through that shame so that their identity is not warped like maybe ours is. Because we've not dealt with it. There are three big ideas here. The first one is perfectionism. And that works like this. We are vulnerable to perfectionism. And what we do is we try to silence our shame with error-free performances. In other words, I am going to do everything from now on perfectly. And what happens with that is that that, uh, we find it very difficult to admit failure from that point on. The second thing is judgmentalism, where we, we are critical of ourselves so much that it makes us to be a critic of everybody else around us. We see our faults and we see it mirrored in everybody around us. So we like transfer that judgmental attitude onto them, that critical thinking, if you want to put it that way. And we could even get arrogant about that when we judge others. The third big idea is this. We use self-defeating thoughts 
as a form of protection and escape. Protectionism. We focus on the, the worst possible outcome. We start with this is going to be bad. Oh, woe is me kind of thinking. And what that does is it sabotages our opportunities to grow as a person, even a spiritual person, and it also sabotages our relationships if we aren't careful. So Christmas can get crazy. Mom flies off the handle and nobody knows why. You know, if she ain't happy, nobody's happy. But nobody can understand why she's lashing out like she is. <clears throat> There's no logical reason for it. Dad, he, you know, he drinks a little, but then at Christmas he gets stone drunk. Because he's trying to escape the shame of something in his life. And so not only does he get drunk, but he disengages from the family, the children, and everybody else. And so this, this Christmas past thing, this ghost, haunts the Christmas season. In-laws get critical, you know? We talked about that a little bit last week in the sermon. And that criticism from in-laws can be very damaging to us. And what happens is we all become hypercritical of each other. Well, today, and, and here's my prayer. Uh, here's what we've talked about as a staff that we would like to do with this particular sermon and all three of these sermons. We are praying that, that this sermon and the other sermons will bring some healing to you. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you left this room this morning free of shame? Could anybody give you a better gift that when Christmas rolls around next year, you don't even remember the shame that you went into this Christmas with? That it's gone. It's over. You are freed. Last week I brought out this chain to talk about how we could overcome the offenses that people have have committed against us. And that chain can just drag us down. Same thing with shame, folks. If we don't get freed of our shame through Christ Jesus, we just are carrying around a chain, and most of the time it has a big ball on the end of it. And our shame overcomes us rather than us overcoming our shame. Isaiah writes in 54, in the fourth verse, these words, God's talking to Israel. Fear not, you will no longer live in shame. Don't be afraid. There's no more disgrace for you. God's saying to Israel, no more, no longer do you need to experience shame because <clears throat> that's not doing you any good. And here's the deal, folks. No one has to live in shame. There is no good reason for any of us to live in shame. We can be freed from the shame. John writes in 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, and that's a big if, because one of the things we deal with with shame is that we, we might believe, what? In, in God's forgiveness. So look what this says. He is faithful and just and will forgive us if we will confess. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from what? All unrighteousness or ungoodness or unrightness or sin. We will be freed from it. No matter what it is, we will be free from it. But our problem is we might even think God will forgive me, but I can't forgive myself for what I've done. I'm never going to get over the shame that I feel and we know the truth. We know that Jesus died on the cross to save us from our shame and our sin. We know the truth. If you didn't know it, you've heard it this morning. That you can be free. You can be forgiven. And I would just say, why stay shackled? Why let the chains of shame shackle you? 
God forgives. The ghost of Christmas past, the ghost of shame, needs to be gone. Here, here's the story. The truth is, it's not easy to get rid of your shame, is it? For the reason I just mentioned. Number one, if you will confess. And that's the hard part. We won't take that step to go to God and say, please forgive me. But in the Old Testament, think about this. In the Old Testament, the Jews had an identity. In the Old Testament, God's people were in slavery in Egypt. They were in slavery for 430 years. Think about it. 430 years. Generations of slavery was their identity. When the Jews thought of themselves as a nation, they thought of themselves as slaves. I was born a slave. I am nothing but a slave. I am a slave. I am worthless. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, they believed the lie. That they were what? A slave. So God sent Moses. Moses is a type of Jesus, by the way, in the Old Testament. What that means is Moses is a is an example of what Jesus came to do years and hundreds of years before he was born. So God sent Moses to go to Egypt and tell the Pharaoh, the king, one of the most powerful kings on the face of the earth at that time, let my people go. They've been in slavery long enough. Let them go. Well, guess what? Eventually, Pharaoh let the people of Israel go. They were delivered from their slavery. After four centuries, they were outwardly free, but they were still inwardly in shame. That's like us. That shameful, sinful thing, we've, we've been delivered because we've come to Jesus and asked for Him to forgive us, but yet we still carry it around. We've been freed from it, but we are still a slave to it. Out of slavery, but is slavery out of, out of Israel? Jesus promised that if I would confess and come to Him, repent of my sins, be baptized and have them washed away, they were gone forever. I do not have to worry about them any longer. And yet shame stays there. And we wrestle around with it. Though you've been forgiven by Jesus... You still live in a shame-based thinking. In our heads we're free, but in our hearts we're a slave. Paul says this to us, and it's from God, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, there's what? No condemnation. You're not condemned any longer, but who is it for? For those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no reason for you to keep your past shame, your sins in your life. They're gone. I mean, no condemnation. I'm reminded of the woman caught in adultery, you remember? And all the religious leaders and some of the other people have picked up rocks. They've drug her to Jesus to try to trap him. She's down in the sand and they're about to kill her with rocks. And he looks at him and says, if you don't have any sin, then you throw the first rock and no one threw a rock they dropped them because why they were guilty of sin but they had shame in their lives that they were thinking the way they were thinking and what did jesus tell her he says you are forgiven but go and sin no more in other words don't keep digging up you're not condemned anymore don't keep this shame in your life lady you don't have to have it Believing that you are something that God says you are not. And that's what we do. That's shame-based thinking when I believe something that's not true. So here's what I want to suggest for you. Move the focus. I believe and I've learned through the years that as long as I'm focused on me, Satan's got me right where he wants me. So I can wallow in my shame and my sin or I can be free of it. 
And I lo- no longer have to deal with it again. It is over. So we move the focus from what I'm not to who Christ is. And that's really the only way to heal the shame. Because there's only one way to get rid of sin and shame, and that's in Jesus Christ, right? Well, somebody might yell amen. If you want to do it late, you can. To focus on self means that I'd never want to be rid of my shame. I want to hang on to it. I want to continue to be shackled. I want to continue to have that chain on me. Listen, I can't break the chain of thinking I'm a bad person if I don't come to Jesus with it. I will continue to think that I am inadequate for anything and anybody. Now, don't get me wrong here. I want to kind of do a little side thing. You are bad sometimes, okay? You got it? Paul in that same Romans letter says what? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So actually, we are all sinners. Everybody that walks in this room is a sinner every Sunday morning, and everybody that walks out continues to be a sinner because we blow it sometimes when it comes to spirituality. And yes, I am inadequate. I will let you down. You will let me down. We're all inadequate in our own strength. And here's the thing. You are not designed to do this by yourself. That is not in your DNA. You don't have to try to handle your sin and shame on your own. We get to thinking I'm pathetic and I'm rude. And sometimes we are, aren't we? We're pathetic and we're rude. But listen, we don't have to carry the sin or the shame of that. As long as you're focused on you, you will never be enough. I'll promise you that. So what I am suggesting is you move the focus to Jesus and be honest before Him. Because here's the thing. Until I have, there's no condemnation, how? To those who are in Christ Jesus. It's just not there's no condemnation to those that knows they're a bad person. It is that I must be in Jesus in order to remove the sin and the shame from my life. And if I've never been obedient to the gospel and I've never accepted God's gift that we celebrate on Christmas and on Easter that He came back to life, if I don't have Jesus in me and and I in Him, I don't have a way to get out of my shame. There is no way I will ever get out of it. Here's a phrase. I am not blank because of Christ. I am blank. I am not blank. But because of Christ, I am blank. Now listen to an example. I am not a bad person. Because of Christ, I am forgiven. That's how you fill it in. I have done some bad things, but I'm not a bad person. I am created in the image of God. I am not sick. Because of Christ, I am healed. I am not broken because of Christ. I'm a brand new creature. I am not disgusting because of Christ. I am loved. You cannot go far enough that God will stop loving you unless you just will not turn for help. And most people will. It takes some of us Longer to get over Fool's Hill than it does others. That's the only thing you've got to think about. Am I foolishly going through my life with my shame when I could be rid of those chains that hold me back? What I'm saying, folks, is Christ is more than enough for 430 years or 1430 years. Christ is enough. When you look at what Joshua, Joshua 5, 9, God talking, then the Lord said to Joshua, this great military leader of Israel, He said, Today I have rolled away the shame of your slavery in Egypt. In other words, you people are still thinking like you're slaves and you have been freed. 
Because Jesus frees us from the slavery of sin. We need to think that we are no longer slaves. See, there's no more shame. Someone might have said to you, shame on you. But God says, shame off of you. Take it away. Jesus does something with it. He removes it. You are not your past. You are not what you did. You are not what someone did to you. You are not who others say you are. You are not who you think you are. You are who Christ says you are. And in Him, He says, you are a redeemed child of God. And you will live forever in eternity. You are forgiven. You are changed. You are free. You are redeemed. You are healed. You are blessed. You are chosen. You are complete. You are accepted. And you are a child of God. That's the bottom line here. No condemnation in Christ Jesus. You remember what Isaiah wrote in 54.4? Fear not. See, that's all through the Bible. Don't be afraid. Don't let fear keep you from getting rid of your shame. You will no longer live in shame. Don't be afraid. There's no more disgrace for you. In Christ Jesus, the shame can be removed. And we can truly be free. You are not what you did. You are who Christ says you are. And as you embrace Him and move your focus to serving the Lord through Christ Jesus, being a disciple of Jesus Christ, then you can overcome anything, particularly shame. Wouldn't it be great that this Christmas... You got rid of the shame that you carry in your life. You can in Jesus.